At Christ Community Church, we believe that the local church is the hope of the world. Every generation plays an important role in building the kingdom of God in this community. So investing in our young people is important because they are our future leaders. We are equipping all ages and all backgrounds for the work of ministry, whether in the field or in the workplace, because God has called everyone to change the world. We believe that the Bible is God's word. We believe God is a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe that the Lord Jesus Christ was and is the eternal Son of God. At Christ Community Church, we are inspiring generations to be world changers for Christ. And so I just want to talk to you this morning about the laws of faith. You know, faith is like vitamin C. You need to take it daily. Faith is something you can talk about. I have people that talk to me all the time. They always say things like, oh, I have the faith, like it's a noun. Faith is not a noun, it's a verb. Faith is how you live. Faith is how you conduct yourself. Faith is how you speak. Faith is how you, uh, how you go about your daily life uh, decisions. And I believe that when we talk about the faith and we get into this, we're gonna find out that there's three uh, principles that make up faith according to the Bible. One is you hear the word of God, two is you speak the word of God, and three is you act on that word. And we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning because I believe that a lot of people get confused about faith. They say, well, I believe in God and I'm doing great. I want to remind you that the Bible is very clear that demon spirits believe in God. And they're not going to heaven. Trust me, they're not going to heaven. So having a belief in God might be the first step, but it's not the final step in your journey. Also, if you heard this morning when the music team was ministering, I'm so uh, gra grateful for Nacia. She was just stepping out and ministering. But there are some things that God wants to break out of our lives. And if you have addictions, if you have substance abuse, if you're uh, struggling with chemical dependency and alcohol, or you're struggling with going through uh, you know, pills and all this kind of stuff, I'm here to encourage you that uh, that doesn't have to be the lifestyle that you engage in that uh, Jesus has a better way. And uh, we're seeing a lot of people with sexual addictions and uh, pornography and all kinds of stuff. Jesus is setting them free. And so we're here to say that, that I like to say it this way, we're the perfect church for broken people. If you're not broken, then we're probably not for you because you want to live to an image that maybe is, doesn't portray that you have any needs. But that's when you find out about Jesus. He's a savior. And the people that he saves, the people that he ministers to, are the people that come to him and acknowledge that he is their Lord, that he is their Savior, he is their source. And that's what the joy is of living a spirit-filled life. That's the, uh, to me, that's the, the, what I'm trying to share with you this morning is that relationship with Jesus trumps everything else. It's, it's the relationship with him. And too often what we do in church is, is I move around, you guys help me with the sound if I need to move somewhere. Whoop. So... You didn't like that comment. Whoop, get it? So as, as it, a lot of people, we get confused as we begin to substitute religiosity or regulations or rules for a relationship. And what I'm about to share with you this morning is not a rule as in when I say the laws of faith, it's built on a relationship. And when you have that relationship, you can trust what that person says to you is true. Like, it's been a while since I've seen Carol and her husband, Bruce. They've been, they've been through the fires of ministry. We're sharing war stories the last couple of nights, going through all these things. And, and we understand, uh, we, we get the, uh, the issues of when you're in ministry and the things and the pressures that go on. But there's a relationship that's there. So I have no reason to doubt anything she told me was absolute truth, even though we haven't seen each other in quite a few years. Why is that? Because of the relationship. You guys follow that. So when God tells you something, you have to realize that he's saying things to you, for you, because of the relationship he has for you, you can trust what he says to you. You can have God speak to you about your situation, and when he says things to you, it's for your good. Here's a great, here's a great revelation. God is in a good mood. He's a God of love, yes. He's a God of justice, yes, but he's in a good mood. 
And he's already told us the secret. He said, every promise, listen to this, every promise that I have made that's recorded in these scriptures right here, every promise is yes. You can come to me and my answer to you is yes. Well, I've been saying, well, that's great. I'm going to ask for this and this and this. There's a little bit of a condition to that, and that is that you have to go through the training to get to the destiny God has for you. And a lot of people don't want to go through the training. They just want to arrive. And I can just use, uh, I could use a lot of examples, but people who win the lottery that aren't trained in how to handle finances, after a few years, they're bankrupt, their family's on drugs, they're doing all these miserable experiences, and they, and they say that they regret that they ever won those multi-million dollar lotteries because they weren't trained in how to handle money. And I'm saying to you, it's like a lot of people say, I want the authority of the kingdom. I want to be a kingdom man, a kingdom woman. I want to be able to pray for people and see miracles. I want to see signs and wonders. I want to have a prophetic voice. When I speak, I want to be just the voice of God. That's wonderful. Those are wonderful things. I'm not, I'm not uh, against your ambition, but are you willing to go through the training? And a lot of times it's no, I'd just rather just kind of get there. And I'm just saying to you, this is what this ministry is going to be this morning. It's just the laws of faith, just to encourage you to develop your relationship with Jesus. And when you develop your relationship with Jesus, you'll find out he will guide you. He will lead you. He will direct you. He has your best interest in mind. You can trust him when he speaks to you. It's for your benefit. Has everybody got that? Amen. Thank you, pastor. Okay. So as we look at this in the book, it uh, tells us in the book of Romans, chapter 3, Romans 3, 27 and 28 says, he's talking about this law of faith. He says, where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. And if you read through Romans 3 and Romans 7, you'll realize that there's all these laws that the apostle Paul writes about. And I just struck me when I saw this phrase, the law of faith. And I realized that there's a principle. We talk, and I'll use a natural laws, the law of electricity. Did you know, I just looked this up, prepared for this message, that there are 40,000 lightning storms, uh, thunderstorms that hit the earth every day. 40,000. Millions, if not billions of volts of electricity go into the earth to recharge the earth's electrical grid. Now, I am not an electrician, but they say that, you know, the negative energy that, that comes with it, you have to ions and neutrons and, and all the other things that are there, that it, that it pours out and it just, and it's what creates the lightning bolts and strikes. But they say sometimes that insects like spiders will catch the wave of electricity and they can float out to sea up to two miles away. Can you imagine being out sea and you see spiders, here comes a whole horde of spiders just floating in the air. So then I'm thinking about this, and I read this article that there's a spider from Brazil that's made its way into Georgia that's coming up the East Coast. Have you guys seen that? The spider is coming. It's like about the size of your hand. And uh, they're, they're, gonna, they're floating in the air, and they're coming up. So if you have a big yellow body, so if you see one, you'll know, hey, that's what Pastor Mitch was talking about. <laughs> that spider got all that negative wave, and off it went. But anyway, the laws of faith. So as we believe in electricity, everybody forget the spiders. Come back to me now. Forget the spider. Come back to me. We're, we're done with that. That was just a little analogy to help get you set. Don't get all excited. But uh, it's just the laws of electricity, currents, they conduct certain ways that, these, that they work. And it makes us, we're able to do, I mean, everything in our house is run by electricity. And you have a big debate going on in our political circles about fossil fuels and solar energy and clean energy and all the things going on. And it's a big war going on between Russia and Ukraine over fuel. And you could go through all this stuff. Well, there's laws that govern uh, electricity. Well, there's laws that govern the kingdom of God. And one is called the law of faith. So I want to read you a couple of things. The Bible tells us how does faith come? It says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? the Word of God. Now listen to me, this is, so, this is so critical to your understanding. The Word of God here is not just reading scriptures, but uses a Greek word called rhema. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by a rhema word from God. What is a rhema? Well, rhema means it's a God-breathed, God-inspired moment. Like this scripture is like the Greek word for these scriptures would be called logos. It just means the written word. But a rhema is where the Spirit of God takes these ancient scriptures 
And God highlights a scripture for you and says, this is a word for you. This is a word for your situation. This is something that you need to pay attention to. I can give you lots of examples. For instance, um, I could, you got so many things going on. Like the other day, this might sound simple to you, but I'm trying to keep it from being too spiritual. But I was just praying and we had to go get some groceries. And so I just, for whatever reason, just asked the Lord, where do you want me to go? Should I go to a regular place or this other place? And the Lord said, go to the other place. Go to the giant food store. So I said, okay, I'll go to the giant. So I'm walking around. It's taking me forever because I don't know where anything is. And I'm walking all around. And I'm thinking, okay, God, now I know I came here because I thought you wanted me to come here. But this is really discouraging to take this amount of time shopping for some few little groceries. And right as I was about to check out, I ran into a Penn State basketball player. Because Reeve and I have season tickets. We've fallen the basketball team. And they lost in an upset game. And it was real heartbreaking to see these senior guys and all this stuff. And I saw the guy. And I was able just to encourage him with his play and his next step in graduation, all this kind of stuff. And the Lord said, that's why I sent you there. And I'm like, hmm, it pays to listen to God. <laughs> it pays just to do it. And that's not, does everybody understand? That's not spiritual. Does everybody got that? I'm not trying to be mystical in that sense. It's just you walk with God. Or there's times, I know you guys will find this hard to believe. Usually I dress, I dress very casual. But one Sunday I got up and the Lord said, put your suit on. I was like, no, I, that can't be God. That's the devil. I, that can't be. <laughs> so I get dressed up, just in obedience, I get dressed up. I come to church and a young lady popped up and she said, Mitch, she said, I'm with ABC News. And we wanted to know about the Joe Paterno scandal. And uh, we want to use your church to see how local churches are reacting to the Joe Paterno scandal. And I was like, glad I dressed up. I get, <laughs> shoot away, have at it. And uh, so then they, they ran the little clip and they did it. And I'm thinking, you know what? Nobody saw that. They probably just edited it out and did all this stuff. Well, my aunt who lives in Tennessee called me. She was so excited because on the national evening news, there I was talking about Joe Paterno and the scandal that had rocked in our reaction at uh, Penn State University. I'm just telling you, God knows what you need. God knows your future. He knows where he wants you to go. And so the law of faith is we're able to take that rhema word and say, God, what is your word for me today? The Bible says that man does not live on bread alone, but by on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The book of Revelation describes the word of God as a stream of life, a river flowing from the throne, and it never stops. There's not a, there's not a famine. There's not a scorched earth a policy there in heaven. The water is flowing deeply. There's, uh, it's not arid. It just flows and flows and flows. And you can drink as much as you want. You can drink any time you want. You can apply it to any need in your life and say, God, I just need a word from you. And so for most of us, and I'm speaking to myself as much as you, most of us, is that we don't want to take the time for the Word of God to be into our lives so we can st read, st uh, study, and know, how do you know this is the God? How do you know this is God? How do you know this is the boundary? How do you know these are the things uh, from God and not things from me? And so we'll talk about that. Let me read you another verse. The Bible tells us in John 10, 27, Jesus said, the sheep that are my own, hear my voice and listen to me. I know them and they follow me. I want to come back to it again. A life with Jesus Christ is not a religion. It's not rules and regulations. It's a relationship. And so when you say you know Jesus, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden all you do is speak in King James English. When you say you know Jesus, it doesn't make you the judge of other people's activities. Oh, that was too good. I didn't, get a good enough, I didn't get a good enough response from you guys. When you know Jesus, you are not the judge. Your job as a fellow sojourner is to walk beside people to say, I get it. Those Ten Commandments, yeah, we've broken every one of them. So I can't throw rocks at you because I got a bunch coming back at me. Jesus said, take the telephone pole out of your own eye before you try to get the little bitty speck out of somebody else's. Yes. And I'm just saying that to keep you from being highly motivated to be legalistic or to be condescending or judgmental on others. Our role, in fact, one of the reasons why I have this little table and not a pulpit is to remind myself every time I come up here, I am like your servant. 
when I'm standing down there, I'm your brother in the Lord. But when I come up here, I become your servant. We went to a restaurant the other night, and you know what? We were seated da- sitting down at the restaurant table, and the waiter came up, or waitress came up, and they take our order. In the same way, when we're here in the pulpit, and I'm speaking and ministering, I'm your servant. I am here to minister the Word of God to you, but we use this table to let us remind ourselves that as servants of the Lord, we're His servants. We're not His, uh, uh, if you would, His lawyers or His attorneys. God has called us to serve our community. That's why we're meeting in here, and they're all out there having all that fun. And as you can see, and it, it just it upsets me so much, and I'm, I'm not here to judge anyone, but on Sunday mornings when we have athletic events, hundreds of people will go through the snow to get their kid to, in my opinion, a worthless athletic event. And then when I challenge families about bringing their kids to church, they get this glassy look and like, oh, I can't bring my kid to church but I'll drive for hours to get them to an athletic event. And I'm just saying that's, that's where our culture has shifted. I'm here as a, listen to this old preacher up here, just to plead with you, that's not the direction you want to go in. You want to teach your children how to love God and how to hear from God and how to get rhema words from God and how to walk with God and how to know God. And I'm here just to encourage you as a church, we're going to do all we can to help you with that. We're not here to throw rocks at you or to judge you. We're here to help stand with you. We've got stuff going with our youth group and our middle school group, things with our grade school. We've got all kinds of stuff through college and young adults. So I'm just saying we're doing all we can to help supply you with the Word of God to make you strong in these perilous times. Amen? So let me just go through a couple of examples in the scriptures that I've just thought about people because Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. He talks about uh, just the different situations people are in. And there's one story that I'll refer to over the next several weeks. We're talking about hearing the word of God. We're talking about speaking the word of God. And then we're talking about acting on the word of God. And this is our theme scripture we had out of the book of Acts chapter 27, verse 25. It says, the apostle Paul was in the midst of a storm the storm was so bad that the ship he was on, it was carried away in the middle of like, almost like a hurricane. They had said they hadn't seen any natural light, sun or moon or stars for weeks. And they realized that as the ship was caught up in that little wooden ship was caught up in that storm, it was going to be demolished. And that there was no hope and no way out. I don't know about you, but I would think I would be very upset to think that my life was going to end at sea in a shipwreck. And the apostle Paul was there, and he says, this night an angel of the Lord came and spoke to me. How many know when you're in the middle of a storm, you need a ram a word from God? And the apostle Paul had a storm, and so here's what he says in verse 25. He says, so he tells us the whole 276 Roman soldiers and passengers on board. He says, so keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. And here's what Paul tells them. The angel Lord spoke to me and he told me we're all going to get out of this safely. No one's going to lose their life. Well, the ship will be destroyed, but we will survive. He says, and I believe this is exactly what happened the way God told me. So he had a rhema word in that moment that in that storm, God gave him direction. Now, the reason the Bible records these stories is for our encouragement. When you're going through a storm, maybe you're going through a marital problem. Maybe you're going through raising your kids and they're acting different. You know, they're not doing the way they should go. Maybe you're in a financial bind right now. Maybe you've got, you know, just emotional needs. Maybe you've got this heaviness and depression and worry. Just, you're just wearied and you just need a rhema word from God from your storm. And I'm telling you, this is what the law of faith is, is that God will always give you a word to meet your need. He will speak directly to your circumstances and to your situation. And that's what I enjoy about faith. The Bible tells us what is faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Well, if your hope is you're going to continue to be a drug addict, how many know that's not much of a hope? If your hope is that you're going to be an alcoholic, that's not much of a hope. If your hope is you're always going to be poor and broke, that's not much of a hope. If your hope is you're always going to be, you know, the tail and behind and you're always kind of like, you know, second fiddle and that you don't have the intelligence to be successful and you don't have the right skills and, you know, you're not really that handsome or beautiful or pretty. You can go through all your excuses. How many know that's not much of a hope? But, you know, you get around Jesus, he gives you incredible hope. You get around Jesus, he gives you incredible destiny. You get around Jesus and he believes in you more than you believe in yourself. Man, I'm preaching myself happy this morning. I'm just telling Jesus... (laughs) 
Jesus believes in you more than you believe in yourself. And when you get around him and hang around him, he's the God of all faith. He has ultimate faith for your life. He believes that he can do great things through you. And I'm a living witness of that. God can do great things through you. And so then I began to study. If you just go through the Bible and just study, and there's so many examples of people getting rhema words from God. I'll take one, 1 Samuel 16, uh, verses 12 and 13, where it says that Samuel, the, the prophet, the prime minister of Israel, came to a little uh, shepherding family, the family of Jesse. He says, there's a, there's a son here that's going to be anointed the next king of Israel. And he says, he came and looked, he saw all seven sons, and one son was the oldest. He said, surely he's the one. And God said, nope, that's not it. He went through all seven sons and said, okay, I must have, you know, I don't know what God's saying. There's a, you, have, you must have another son because none of these guys are going to be anointed king of Israel. And here's what the family said, the family of Jesse. They said, you know, we've got one brother. He's the youngest. He's not really, I mean, there's not much hope for him. And he's out watching the sheep because we knew you were coming here and we want to prepare a feast and we're all here. And he's out in the woods with, or out in the field with the sheep. And Samuel said, go get him. So he bring in David, the youngest one. And God said, that's the man that I'm going to anoint to be king of Israel. Yeah. What were his qualifications? He could probably make sheep noises. <laughs> bah, bah. He walked around with a few sheep. In fact, his brothers later on in the story, when he goes to fight Goliath, his brother said, why'd you leave the few sheep and come out here? You just want to see the battle. So there was no respect. Shepherding, even in those days, was a low-life, classless job. But God had a word for David. God spoke to David and said, David, you're going to lead my people. You're going to be king over millions of people. And then for the next 17 years of his life, it was miserable. Because the existing king found out that Samuel had anointed David to be king. And after he got that tri uh, incredible triumphant victory over the giant Goliath, all of a sudden David's life went from here to here, but the trouble escalated also. But he had a word from God. God said, you're going to be king. So we went into battle against Goliath. David knew he couldn't be defeated. He couldn't die. Why? Because he had a word from God. God said, I'm going to be king. Well, I can't die if I'm fighting Goliath because I have to be king. Why do you have to be king? Because God said so. Yeah. Right. So it's like, and I'm just, I'm just here just to encourage you. Somewhere. I mean, you've got physical sickness in your body, and your body is sick, and you've got this problem. you just got to say, you know what? This is not my destiny. God's promised me health. Maybe you've got mental issues. You've got heaviness and depression and worry and fear, and it just, just, it just grates on you every day. You just got to be like David. You're going to fight through it. Fight, fight, fight. Stand in the walls of faith. Speak the word of God. Watch what God will do, and God will deliver you. He'll set you free. You'll be able to walk out of that. As David was able to walk into his kingship, so you'll be able to walk into the destiny that God has for you. That's the joy we have of serving Jesus. There's other stories. You could go to 2 Chronicles 24 where it talks about a king named Josiah, one of the most greatest reformers ever seen in the, in the whole history of kings uh, of Israel and in Judah. And he talked about the king Josiah was full of uh, astrology. They were worshiping the sun god, moon god, all these other gods. And it said that as, uh, as he was worshiping these other gods, the nation of Israel, that they said, you know what, we'll go back to the temple and we'll just clean out the temple. We'll get rid of all the, you know, it was a storage space and we'll pull out all the stuff and we'll get it back where we can go back to all, all worshiping God the way we're commanded to. As they go in to clean out the temple, they find the word of God. They open it up. And there in the scriptures, listen to this, tell my raising the hair on the back of your neck. There is a scripture where it says that there was a man of God 300 years earlier. They came and prophesied that there would be a king by the name of Josiah. And he would fumigate the land of all the astrology and all the witchcraft and all the sexual perversion. He's going to bring reformation to the nation Israel. So they pull the, they pull the document out. They are shocked. They go running into the king's chambers. They say, king, you got to look at this. They read it to him. It says he falls to the ground, tears his clothes, says, my God, my God, you've pre-programmed, predestined me for greatness. And it says that King Josiah fumigated the land of Israel because he saw his name was written in the book. Amen. Wow. Let me just pause here for a second. Wow. God 
has your name written in his book. He has your name written in his book. And I will say this, I'll go a step further. God has for you a destiny. And God wants your destiny to be under the arching umbrella of his purposes. And his purpose is for our church and for our community to experience, I believe, an awakening. I believe that God has designated this community to experience an outpouring of the Spirit of God. I believe that God has for us, I believe that God has for us things that we've not seen or heard in decades that we're going to experience. I believe that the Lord has people here in this room that you don't know what a powerhouse in the kingdom of God you are. And if you can hook up with what the word says to what your destiny is and to be able to walk in that realm of word and see what God can do, God would do some amazing things. Let me tell you, can I tell you just a quick story? This happened just a couple of weeks ago. We were, uh, I was up sharing, I was talking about how that we had this Muslim man that was uh, full of cancer and his sister, we'd prayed for her years ago and she gotten healed and he was coming to church uh, to get, uh, or he was coming to town to be prayed for. Well, I didn't know it at the time, but he was in the service. And at the end of service, he came up. This is two weeks ago in the gym. He came up. His name was Sharif. And he goes, he says, he says Pastor Matt, you spent about 10 minutes telling me his story. He says, I'm a believer now. I gave my heart to Christ and I want to serve him. He says, I want to go for Jesus. He said, but I've been diagnosed with cancer and I need prayer. And so I was able to explain to him that Jesus was a healer. I said, I can't heal you, but Jesus can. And I said, I want, when we pray for you, it's just that Jesus is going to heal you. So I prayed for him, and God did some wonderful things and kind of laid the foundation. But then when the lady in our church, Sister Mila, when she began to pray for him, things happened. Wow. I'm telling you, the guy was standing there, and she prays over him. And the next thing I know, he goes flying back onto the ground, which reminds me, time out from that story. Did you know... <laughs> Did you know that we have a reputation in town as a church where people fall down? I'm like, where did that come from? That doesn't happen, like, it doesn't happen all the time. It just happens every once in a while. People get, but uh, anyways, and people are kind of nervous about these spirit-filled churches, like what's going to happen to them. Let me tell you what's going to happen when you get filled with the Holy Spirit. You're going to love people that you didn't know you could love. You're going to like people you didn't know you could like. You're going to enjoy people you didn't know you could enjoy. You're going to see God just open your heart up to people that you have no business running around with, and you're going to see God do some amazing things when you get filled with His Spirit. So, all right, so back to the story. Okay, so we're back. So we're back with Sharif, and he gets, he gets slain this week. He, just, he goes down, he's laying there, and the next thing I know, I'll watch him, and his, he just takes his right arm, and just raises it up over his head. He said, I haven't been able to do this in weeks. He said, I haven't been able to move like this. And we believe, I didn't tell him he was healed, but I believe that God touched him in a supernatural way. Yeah. Are you hearing what I'm saying? God, the Holy Spirit is doing some amazing things. God, the Holy Spirit is drawing people. And that's why we're living in an age where some of the prophetic voices who are speaking for a rhema word for our generation at this time are saying there will be a billion souls come to Christ. The harvest is here. The harvest is here. The harvest is here. So let me take, let me take just another second and just go through this because we're going to close. But I've been, I've been looking at how do you know that you have a prophetic word from God? And I found this in my Bible, and I just want to just share with you how to judge the words of God. Number one is, does a word from God, does it lead me to Christ and fill me with a love for his church? I believe that's how you can know, is this a word from God? Number two, I want to align myself, does this word from God align itself with the clear and complete teachings of the Bible? I just want to encourage you, there are a lot of false prophets today. There's one guy that every time we see it, Reeve and I get in a big argument, but I'm like, he's a false prophet. He's writing a national book, and if you read his books, it's always some negative things about to happen, and he goes through all these, the harbinger things, the things to come, and I'm telling you, if you guys don't have your spiritual ears up and you swallow and follow everybody that claims the title prophet, you're missing the mark. And I'm just telling you, I'd rather take what the Bible says than what some person claims to be a prophet and gives you some, uh, some weird interpretation of scriptures. Are you hearing me? Number three is it does this word from God strengthen my faith and give me an honorable purpose in life? Number four, does this word from God turn me from wrongdoing and promote righteousness and purity in my life? 
Number five, this is word from God. Find wide acceptance and affirmation by notable men and women of God. Sometimes you got to go to others and ask their opinion on things. And I do this all the time. Number six, does this word from God build up the body of Christ, equipping believers for the work of ministry? And those are six little signs that you can use to look at this. All right, we're closing here because this is what the Lord put on my heart. I want to pray for you this morning to have an ear to hear rhema words from God. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Every child of God is entitled to hear from their dad. You have a heavenly father that loves you so much more than you can imagine. You have a God in heaven who created you for destiny and purpose and life. You have a God in heaven who when he looked at your life, listen to me, it brings a smile to his face. You say, oh, how can that be? Because I've messed up. I mean, I've had all these bad things happen to me. I've done bad things. I can go through all this stuff. I'm just telling you, look at the story. And I didn't go into much detail, but the story of the Apostle Paul. He grew up hating Christians. He grew up with a passion to throw men, women, and children in jail. And he did it. And he loved every minute of it until he had an encounter with Jesus. And that encounter with Jesus changed his life. Much like Carol shared with us earlier this morning, that encounter with Jesus as a student at the University of Washington changed her life. An encounter with Jesus will change your life. Not religion, not church, a relationship. Yeah. And that's what I keep coming back to. Jesus has a word for you. Jesus has destiny for you. Jesus has purpose for you. You have to listen. So here's what the Bible says in a couple of verses in Isaiah. It says this, the sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen like one being instructed. If you will take that verse, Isaiah chapter 50, verse four, if you will take that verse and say, God, every morning when I wake up at the minute my eyes like my grandkids, the minute, <laughs> the minute my eyes open up, God, let my ears be able to hear you. Lord, let your spirit be able to guide me and direct me. Lord, let your spirit be wanted to tell me what direction I should go. Because as you understand, when you're serving Jesus, you are bought with a price. You are not your own. You're under his lordship. You know, every major Bible uh, preacher that I could talk to, like you talk about like Rick Warren or Andy Stanley or Andrew Walmack or some of these other guys that are out there, they all talk about hearing from God. And you have the most dynamic possibility to hear from God for your situation. Yes. And he will never lead you outside of the boundaries of the scriptures. So the law of faith is what? Faith comes by what? Hearing. Hearing what? A word from God. How does faith come? Faith comes by hearing. Hearing a word of God. Like this morning, you can hear everything I'm saying, and you can say, you know, I don't believe that. And you can walk out of this room and say, I don't believe God has a destiny for my life. I don't believe that God has a purpose for my life. And you can go about your merry way. Or you could take, like I've discovered, you could take the risk to trust the God that sent his one and only son to die for you, to trust him that if I follow him and, and I'm obedient to his leading, he will get me to a better place than I can get on my own. And you have to make that decision. That's your choice. We're here just to encourage you. We're here just to inspire you. We're here just to, to celebrate with you as you continue to walk with God and hear from God and obey God to realize that God has some tremendous purposes for your life. Listen to what it says in Isaiah 30, verse 21. It says, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk you in it. This is the way, walk you in it. I've got so many other stories here in the Bible of people who've heard words from God, people that the Bible says are written for our instruction. Uh, we could talk about this. Let me just give you one a quick example. And you can tell Dr., uh, Dr. Rice this story. We had a concert a couple of weeks ago with a group called Sidewalk Prophets. Maybe some of you came to that. It was a wonderful concert. We met the guy who was the chaplain of the band. His name was Bobby Lingo. And uh, Bobby came up and he was talking to us and he said, he, listen to this, he said, I had a dream. This chaplain guy had a dream. He says, I was standing in my backyard and I saw this guy walk up out of the woods to my yard. And he says, I remember asking him, 
I want to know how to walk in the spirit. And he goes, uh, he says, he's talking to this guy in the dream. And the guy goes, no, I'm not going to tell you. And the guy turned around and walked back into the woods. And Bobby said he was standing there and he's like, okay, do I stay here in my familiar yard or do I follow this guy because I want to know how to walk in the spirit? So he said, and the guy started walking faster and faster, and he started walking faster and faster. The guy started running, he started, he was not going to let go of this guy that was going to show him how to walk in the Spirit. Now, this is a, a Baptist ministry. He's been in all kinds of churches, done all kinds of cool things, but he had this hunger. He wanted to know more about how to walk in the Spirit. So that was the dream. The next day, he goes to a conference in Nashville, and our friend, Dr. Rice Brooks, is up speaking, and he, Bobby Lingo comes up, and he goes, you're the man. You're the man that's supposed to show me how to walk in the spirit. So I'm standing here in this, in this gymnasium talking to Bobby Lego about my friend Rice Brooks. And I said, yeah, Rice will tell you how to walk in the spirit. That's what he does. That's what it's all about. He says, I'm just so hungry. And he had some physical problems and we prayed for him and ministered to him. There is a hunger for the supernatural. There is a hunger for the manifest power of God to go for. And I'm here just to encourage you that you never know how God's going to open doors. But I thought it was funny that this, he had this dream about some preacher. He goes to the conference. The preacher's our friend, Dr. Brooks. And then he talks to me, and I know Dr. Brooks, so we're able to confirm some things. It was just an amazing thing. So I'm, I'm here just to encourage you that people have all kinds of needs. And we don't have the ability to meet those needs. But Jesus does. And it can introduce people to my friend Jesus, and Jesus is able to set the captives free. Jesus is able to set the victory. Jesus is able to take you to higher places and walk a better life and live a, a, and have a better emotional life and all these things. Why? Because of Jesus. I could go through and just share with you story after story. Like, I just want, well, well, as a music team out there, I'm, just, I'm supposed to read Acts 27, 25 again. Okay, I did it, so you guys come on up. But my, I got to tell, tell you one more quick story. My mom. This is my, my 80 some odd year old mom. Yeah, 84 year old mom now, okay. She, my dad died seven years ago. She'd spent about three or four years living by herself. She hated loneliness and she wasn't moving to Pennsylvania. She didn't want to get up here in this cold weather. So uh, she was just praying and the Lord spoke to her. Listen to this. The Lord spoke to her about the possibility of getting remarried. And she had a guy that she had met at a, in her with my dad at their previous church. And so she had some mutual friends. She said, would you just ask Norm if he'd be interested in, in pursuing a relationship? So the mutual friends reached out to Norm. Norm said, yeah. Norm jumps in his car, drives all the way up to Tennessee to see my mom. They talk over Christmas. This is about a year ago. And about three weeks later, they get married. I'm like, mom, what's wrong with you? You know, like what... <laughs> But the point that I'm going to say, and if you ever talk to her and Norm, is she will tell you this came from the Lord, that she was praying and the Lord put it in her heart. She wanted to get remarried and she was looking for a person that she could remarry. And she felt like God gave her, you know, Norm's name, reached out to him. He responds in faith. They get together and in a short time, they're married and they're just happy as two little peas in a pod, just tooling all around their little, little Prius electric car, you know, just zipping all around and <laughs> doing all this stuff. But my point is, is not so much about my mom as it is God knows you. Yeah. And he knows where you're at. And he knows what you're going through in life. Yeah. And he's here just to encourage you, to let you know you can trust him. He has a word for you. Now, I know that last Sunday, Pastor Jim and I said about their destiny and we're going for it. And man, it's just rah, rah. It was great stuff. But this morning, it's just about, man, if you'd like to hear from God. If you would like the Lord to speak to you about your situation, what you're going through, I just want to pray for you. So if you would just stand with me and let me just pray for you. We're going to pray Isaiah 50, chapter 50, verse 4. We're going to pray Isaiah 30, verse 21. He opens my ears every morning. He awakens my ears to hear. We're going to talk about how that God has a word that says, this is the way, walk you in it. Turn to the right, the left, whatever. That's what it's all about. Okay, so those of you who are staying, those who are on, just do whatever you need to do to, to get, just to receive from God. So before I do this, let me just, just, just slow down a second just to make sure that Jesus is your best friend, but he's also your Lord. And by that, it means that you've given up the right. 
if you would to say no to him it's a yes Lord every time you read the scripture it's always yes Lord you can't say no Lord it's yes Lord so if you've not given your life to Christ you're not surrendered to him this is a moment you can do it just pray with me I pray pray this prayer say these words you just say Lord Jesus I ask you to forgive me I ask you to cleanse me Jesus I ask you to fill me Jesus I pray that you would be my Lord and Savior that starts you on the journey of faith. That starts you in this place. And I always like when people say, well, I've lived a bad life. I've done these terrible things. There is no sin that you have done that will ever, ever thwart the blood sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. The blood of Jesus is greater than any sin any man could ever commit. And I'm here just to encourage you with that. Also, number two is that because you've made Jesus Lord of your life, you're now in the family of God. You are a child of God. You have every, uh, every right to receive the promises as someone who's been living with God for decades as to someone who just started. You're at the same, uh, same level. You've got the same access to the things of God. So as you're standing here, I just need you just to be a point of receiving. Is we're just going to open our palms up, just like we're receiving from the Lord. I just got, I got my eyes closed. I'm just praying with you, for you. Pray for myself as much as you. And we're going to ask God as we're standing before him this morning. Lord, we're asking you as a congregation that you would speak to us, that you would direct us, that uh, you are a living God with a living word. It's not a static, stale, uh, traditional Bible. It's God, it's a living, a living vibrant word for us to live on. You've already challenged us according to uh, Deuteronomy 8.3 that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Lord, let us be that people. Lord, let us be that congregation. Lord, let us be that uh, part of that group that knows how to hear from God, and knows how to walk with you, and knows how to obey you, and knows how to serve you. God, we pray that we would have the ears of a disciple. Lord, I pray that you would open our ears to hear as a learned one. That God, that you would give us that direction, where to turn, where to walk, what to do. That God, that we can depend on you. Father, I pray for those that are struggling with all the different issues that we've mentioned earlier, that, God, that there'd be hope in the midst of their storm. That even as you spoke to your servant Paul and said, today, today I've heard you. Today I'm going to rescue you. Today is your day of deliverance. Father, let us be able to walk in the same hope and the same life. Father, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. And everybody believes this is a big amen.